thank you very much, Carl. So uh, I'm going to present uh, yeah, some information to you today about um, how you could potentially um, trace these O or just HMs uh, by genomics. So as Ilsa already indicated in the first talk, this um, yeah, genomic traceability part might also be um, possible in the future. And I just wanted to um, sum up here a complete guideline what, what needs to be done and what, what is the background. So first, uh, what is actually the aim of it? Of course, you all want to have a reproducible measurement of a genomic composition of, of your population. Um, it shouldn't be too costly, um, for sure not. And uh, surely you want to see inside your population like you are doing a uh, scan with the, uh, with the Röntgen or so. Um, so the information you would like to, to get are maybe uh, did the population change over time or adapted to a location? Uh, which loci are inherited, by which parent, is there a linkage drag or um, even an adaption uh, to a farming system? Um, or maybe also did an over-adaption uh, occurred, adaptation occurred um, to, for example, a certain uh, allele trait of a allele of a gene. And with this coming the question, should the farmer now replace his population with a new one. So the ideal case scenario, I would say, would look something like this. You are having now here in this particular case, barley, all your seven chromosomes, and you're having a frequency across all these chromosomes indicating to you the allele frequency of one of your um, parents in this population, which you can then ultimately can attribute to a specific gene that you already know, and then check. Um, it's a uh, corresponding allele frequency and see how much, for example, this one here, how much of the um, uh, population carries this specific allele. So ultimately it comes down to the question, are the populations different, which regions are different and which traits have been altered to this? Um, so I want to guide you through this entire yeah, process of getting this information. And the first one is for sure getting the DNA from the population. Um, and uh, what we have been doing in the past was we constructed pool samples, uh, which were consisting of uh, several hundreds of seeds as a representative sample of, for the entire population. Usually this range is in between 300 to 1000 seeds. Um, you can then go on and grind the seeds to, to flour. So in such grinding mill as shown here in this uh, picture, um, which has some benefits, but also some yeah, negative consequences coming with this. So for example, you don't need to grow your plants in a greenhouse. You have quite low labor costs and you don't necessarily need liquid nitrogen um, but for instance, the DNA extraction from seed material is quite challenging, as some of you might know. Alternatively, you could also go on and um, do this on fresh leaf material, where you have to make sure that you collect equally sized leaf discs for each genotype so that each genotype contributes the same amount of tissue material and therefore DNA. Uh, usually you don't have this um, as a big um, aspect coming here for the seeds because usually the seeds tend to be at least uh, similar sized. And yeah, for this leaf approach, you have some um, benefits, um, but also some negative aspects. The benefit, of course, is that the DNA extraction is much more straightforward and simple. But you need to have a, a greenhouse or a place where you can grow these days for about you know, 14 days, where you then can collect these samples, which is quite labor intense, and then freeze these uh, samples. Um, after you collected this um, material, the DNA or RNA extraction um, yeah, is a bit different for, for these two starting materials. So for flour, for instance, um, 
we did quite a lot of uh, trial and error and figured out that you need to have at least one gram of flour starting material. Um, and you also need, um, compared to the standard DNA extraction from, from a fresh material, an additional purification step. And um, one also quite um, necessary step was to uh, let the uh, DNA elude in an overnight step. And yeah, for the leaf disc, you just have to make sure that your grinding in your grinding mill worked uh, quite properly so that you have a fine powder and no um, yeah, DNA bias for genotypes uh, based on um, unhomogeneous grinding. So once you have the DNA, you can go on and send it out for sequencing or do the sequencing yourself. Um, we have some technical requirements for these as well. So um, one is that you have to know the uh, parental haplotype. So ideally you sequence also the parents. Um, this is especially necessary when you perform short read sequencing, what is uh, the, the common use of sequencing at the moment. Um, you need to have some high quality sequencing results so that your uh, chord base pairs are of uh, high precision. And uh, especially helpful is also a reference genome like you can download here on the San Samuel Plants website. And one final aspect that helps out increasing the accuracy of your results is when you uh, create your data by a um, SNP database uh, so that uh, falsely called um, variants are uh, removed from a data set. So I also kind of um, listed here a comparison of different uh, approaches, how to sequence, at which sequencing depth, and yeah, which kind of technique you want to use. Um, in a previous work, we compared uh, this whole genome sequencing to an RNA-seq and the genotyping by sequencing approach. But uh, these days also Oxford Nanopower, PacBio become much more um, yeah, relevant. These days, and I also listed here these uh, yeah, four different levels of sequencing depth. I will come uh, to this aspect later on um, um, because we can reach different um, levels of results with each of these um, sequencing depth levels. One thing that I also want to note here is that the more related your parents are, so in worst case scenario, siblings. Uh, the less uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms can be found. And um, for the approach I want to present, uh, this indicates or requires that you perform a higher sequencing depth. So the data processing is quite straightforward. Once you have made sure that uh, your reads are of a sufficient quality, you can align it to your reference genome. Um, our typical um, work way was to remove all uh, duplicate reads because these could alter uh, the allele frequency in an uh, unwanted way. You um, detect your single nucleotide polymorphisms, um, estimate the read depth for each of these uh, SNPs, and then construct an haplotype from these kind of SNPs. So, um, the haplotype is the key aspect uh, to get an accurate frequency estimation from this low coverage sequencing. Um, because when we know, um, yeah, when we can aggregate uh, several SNPs into one haplotype, um, we can, um, yeah, make use of uh, or aggregate also the read depth of these SNPs. So for instance, we need to know the initial haplotype coming from these parental lines. And uh, what is another helpful aspect is this uh, linkage disequilibrium so that various SNPs are linked on the same genomic fragment. And how does it look like on actual data is something like this. So um, I just selected here one uh, exemplified uh, genome from the uh, uh, chromosome from the wheat genome. Uh, for three um, populations uh, from three weed uh, populations are of the same origin. And you can see, for instance, what's marked here in black. These are the um, 
linkage blocks that are remain together. So you can particularly see that here in the centromeric region, we have the biggest block, but also um, to the telomeric sites, we have, of course, more blocks, but they are still quite, quite huge of uh, several million uh, base pairs. And uh, this kind of uh, aspect we can use to uh, construct uh, highly accurate uh, haplotype allele frequencies instead of uh, single nucleotide based allele frequencies. And the concept behind this is that you yeah, get basically your information from the sequencing with your uh, SNPs uh, scattered across the, um, your genome. And you also um, get a certain uh, another information about your your read depth, so how many um, sequences cover the specific genomic region, and about your frequency of one of your parents. Um, so that three out of ten reads would be associated to parent two. So elsewise, you also get this information from, from uh, uh, exemplified the ensemble plants database, um, the information where a gene is located, but maybe also which kind of markers from these famous chips uh, are located where, or you could also create an artificial contig across a, a specific range of a, of a chromosome. What you can do with these genes um, is that you can extend them into the intergenic region. Why uh, would you do that? Um, yeah, just because uh, the majority of SNPs are mapping into the intergenic region. And when you want to have some haplotypes that you can annotate directly to a gene, then it would be useful to cluster all these SNPs that are close, close by to, to these genes as well. Similar, you can do, of course, with the markers and then extend it to a much broader range. But as we have seen before, these linkage blocks are quite, quite big. So we are not messing around or doing any, any problems here. Um, so when we are going this step here from an, a SNP-based allele frequency to an haplotype allele frequency, we can see that when we are aggregating this frequency across this entire region of um, this chromosome, we are getting to um, yeah, average allele frequency weighted by the read depth, uh, which is much closer to the true value than the ones that are really ranging high from 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. Um, you can also do this, of course, based on, on your gene level. So um, this, for instance, um, improves the resolution of your of your analysis and you can finally target some specific genes that might be on the selection so we also um yeah validated this approach of course um so we did um genotype 288 genotypes so three uh, 96 well plates once a single genotype uh, DNA extraction and then sequencing and once in pool sequencing. So these single genotypes were um, uh, genotyped by selected cusp markers. And you can see here on the, on the right-hand side that um, we compared here this pool allele frequency versus this cusp allele frequency from, from individual genotyping. And the dashed line indicates the optimal fit so for the SNP, you see a clear deviation from this um, ideal fit, but already on the gene annotated haplotypes, you see with this red line, it's fairly close by here. And this one here indicates your read coverage rate. And um, I want to highlight this one here, which has a quite high coverage, over 1000 reads for this entire haplotype. And you can see that for each of these SNPs that were clustered together, we are having an allele frequency ranging from zero to one. So the maximum span you can possibly have. But uh, aggregating an average value puts them right on spot where they have to be. And similar results you obtain for this marker anchored haplotypes and um, yeah, somehow also uh, for this quantic haplotypes. So um, 
one step further, we were also comparing these sequencing methods. I um, have shown this table with these uh, with the costs for these four sequencing methods. And what we compared were these three short read sequencing approaches with the RNA seq, with the whole genome sequencing and genotyping by sequencing. And uh, what you can see is that um, yeah, all of them are kind of suitable to find um, the, the major variations, but when you want to dig deeper, um, then the whole genome sequencing has a much more cleaner um, result than the GBS or the RNA-seq. Uh, there are no such um, um, haplotypes with an, with an off-target um, off uh, leaf frequency estimation. And we also um, have seen that across uh, multiple replicates we um, created for, for this, that the uh, variation among these um, full sample replicates are much higher than uh, in the in the RNA sec and in the GBS compared to the whole genome sequencing approach. So what information can we actually extract and what we want to have? The first one, the, the least resolution one, I would say, that you can achieve with ultra low sequencing are the populations different on a statistically significant level. The second level you can reach with low sequencing coverage is what has changed. So which regions, which chromosomal regions were different. And finally, which traits were, were, traits were subject of frequency changes. So which genes have altered. And therefore, you typically need a medium level sequencing. So the first one would be the lowest um, sequencing level. So giving you a result as indicated, for instance, in here. So we are having two different uh, locations here, indicated here as a conventional and organic one here with these different types of shapes. And this one here is the population you have created. And after these generations, you see that they they are different, and you can clearly identify that um, these populations are different from the start, and also different for different locations, and even on uh, the different generations. So the second level would give you a more higher resolution that you're kind of seeing. Okay, we have here this block which is kind of up-selected in this uh, conventional environment after these 14 generations, quite, quite high from these 12.5% up to 30%. So now um, when you would go for much uh, or further deeper level of sequencing, you could um, go further on and perform some statistical analysis coming from these allele frequency information. Um, to identify some um, very uh, condensed genomic regions under selection. So for instance, you are seeing here this allele frequencies uh, across different years, which uh, might not make too much uh, yeah, sense to identify a single uh, loci right now, but with these um, black diamonds and these gray bars indicating, so indicating some known uh, low side for, in this case, um, drought tolerance, we could perform some statistical analysis and see then that we have um, some uh, statistically significant alterations across the years for these two um, low side that were previously also described uh, by QTLs or GWAS analysis. So this is my run through. Uh, through how uh, this genomic approach could help to, to trace uh, these um, heterogeneous uh, materials and yeah, give a guideline to you.